Hi guys. Well, looking out the window, you think it would be a spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful spring day here in the Sunshine State, but it feels more like mid-January all of a sudden here in mid-March. Good Lord, what a difference a day makes. But anyway, it is a Sunday morning. A chilly, windy Sunday morning, March 13th, 2022, I believe. And since it is Sunday morning, I'm going to bring you our weekly doomsday sermon. And it's one of my uh, alert down under, and maybe it was Brother Eric that sent me this from down under, this story from The Guardian, a first-person report of those uh, cataclysmic biblical floods going on down there in Australia that got a little bit of mention up here in the uh, mainstream media news, you know, all wrapped around that little distraction over the pond. So uh, let's hear what the collapse of everything is going to sound like. And this is not for the little brown people, you know what I'm saying. This is what it's going to look like, you know, for middle class, uh, middle class white folks acting who act like this has nothing to do with, uh, with us. So uh, we're going to hear, this is actually a woman with the name of Eddie, not Edie, but Eddie. Eddie Lloyd. Eddie Lloyd uh, and her sermon from a few days ago titled, The Australian Prime Minister Calls This a Natural Disaster. It's not natural. It's climate change smashing down our doors. So this is coming out of Lindsmore, Australia. You, what, you don't like your little little dogs and go find him another place to sleep, I guess. Uh, this is from Lindsmore, where the floods have drowned out homes, lives, and futures under a sea of mud. And Eddie, she is wondering, what is our government doing? Like, there's really a, a lot that the government of Australia is, is going to do about this scene of uh, biblical destruction. <clears throat> Take it away, Eddie. It took three days after the rescue to get back and assess the damage to my partner's home in North Lismore. At least it is still standing Everything is brown. Muddy waters and debris block our way, so we grab some washed up scaffolding and wood to make a bridge to cross the water filled ditch over the back of the disused rail line. My partner, his friend, my eight year old son, and I cross the bridge crab style, then climb over the railway tracks and through more muddy water into the backyard. The smell is horrendous. It's a mix of rotting rubbish, diesel, dust, and mud. The sky is a piercing blue. An ironically beautiful day after such a cataclysmic event. We are grateful for the sun after such relentless rain, but the stunning blue against the muddy landscape is jarring. I wonder what is happening in Ukraine. I had heard in passing that Vladimir Putin might press the button. As if my brain can contemplate that right now, before the floods I was engaged in the geopol geopolitics of the Russian invasion, but now the war is in my backyard. That is the only way to describe the scene here. 
Sometimes you can't even have a conversation because of the noise of the helicopters overhead still rescuing people after three days. All around are brown mud, dust, broken buildings and scattered possessions strewn and piled across the landscape. But it is the putrid smell that overwhelms every sense and we know it will grow in intensity as the hot day ferments the rotting detritus and vegetation. We get to the front yard and up the muddy steps to the porch. The smell is so intense I nearly vomit. The porch freezer is upturned and its contents are rotting. We go inside. We can't even get into one of the rooms as the door is jammed. Every piece of furniture, drawers, cupboards, fridge, washing machine, and belongings has been strewn about the house. <clears throat> then we hear the squeals. My partner races in, frantically climbing over the upturned furniture in bed, <clears throat> and there is Prince, our beautiful long-haired guinea pig, alive, <clears throat> along with his harem of girls. This small mercy breaks us. We thought all the animals were dead. Somehow, the guinea pigs survived floating to the ceiling in their tubs, which did not capsize despite the, this says 15 meter flood height. I'm thinking they left the uh, decimal point out. I think she meant one and a half meter, which is little shy of five feet. I don't think she meant 50 feet. I think she meant uh, about five feet, but who knows. Uh, <clears throat> Back out in the glaring sun, we don't know where to start. It is too overwhelming. Not just what we have to deal with here, but the whole situation, our neighbors, our destroyed town, the reality of a house washed up against the bridge. I think of the lady who is clinging for her life to the window of her house and wonder whether she made it out alive. The police do not want us in the city center today as they pull out the bodies. We were lucky we didn't die. I called the state emergency service at 6 a.m. on Monday morning, you know, I meaning six days ago, after climbing to our attic to wait out the flood, but the waters kept rising. After seven hours of waiting to be rescued, we hailed a passing tinny, which I think is what we call a John boat here. We hailed a passing John boat driven, driven by our neighbor Sandro, an unknown neighbor over the railway line. Sandro and Amanda left their house searching for their dog Diesel and instead ended up rescuing more than 100 people that day. Likewise, our friends Aiden and Tim left their homes and belongings to drown and took their John boat despite the emergency service instructing people not to use their own boats to save people. Thank goodness for our local heroes because the two official rescue boats could not keep up with the rescues. As Sandro took us to the nearest land, we saw roofs cut open where people had sheltered in their attics, only to realize that they would become their coffins if the water kept rising. 
we drive through Lismore Central Business District, it looks as though it has been bombed. Business owners are piling everything onto the street to make way for the rubbish collection that will last for weeks and resemble a post-apocalyptic horror film. Many won't recover from this. Businesses are saddled with debt from the last flood and the preceding two years of corona panic lockdowns. It is too much to bear. My partner cried for months after the 2017 flood, seeing the, seeing the damage done to our much-loved town, but this time we are numb to it. My son is in shock, going quiet at the state of his beloved CBD. I don't know what CBD is, and, and, and I don't know why editors do this. I guess people in Australia know what CBD means. I mean, all I could think of was Central Business District, uh, but I don't think that's it. Anyway, she uses this term CBD a lot through here, never telling us what a CBD is. It is uh, collapsed and broken down, I guess. Anyway, uh, my son is in shock, going quiet at the state of his beloved CBD, and then crying for hours as he tries to come to terms with it, and the fact that his school is gone and closed indefinitely. I don't know how we can recover. When will the next flood come, or will the bushfires get us next? I see on Twitter that the Prime Minister has corona panic and is calling this flood a, quote, natural disaster. This same narrative is parroted by the government, but there is nothing natural about it. This is climate change in action and pretending we are not experiencing a climate catastrophe right now is dangerously irresponsible. Remember, we are only at the beginning of the hockey stick curve. Things are going to get much worse. Until the corona panic created insane housing prices, Lensmore was an affordable place to live. North Lensmore being on the floodplain and the victim of the CBD levy. CBD is something to do with the local government. Be, and li, being on the floodplain and victim of the levy rather than a beneficiary of it was the most affordable and is home to some of its most endearing as well as the most vulnerable members of our community. For almost everywhere on the floodplain, flood insurance is a near impossibility with premiums close to $30,000 per year. Despite people de spending more than 100, the, the flood insurance premiums are now at $30,000 per year, and despite people spending more than $100,000 to raise their homes above the nominal one in 100 year flood height, this flood exceeded such levels by more than two meters, which is uh, more than six feet. For many people in North Lismore, this meant more than five meters of water on the ground, <clears throat> drowning homes, lives, and people's futures under a sea of mud. We're at the threshold 
of a climate catastrophe and it is communities like ours that are bearing the brunt of it. It is not just lapped at our doorstep like was going on, you know, with my little house in New York last summer. It is not just lapped at our doorstep. It smashed right through our doors. <clears throat> it has destroyed our mysterious CBD and <clears throat> our loved ones have drowned to death. These climate catastrophes are going to happen more frequently <clears throat> with more intensity, more damage, and more deaths. And we will see more communities collapsing. Back at the front line of the climate crisis, we set up a wash station. Our neighbors, drenched in muddy water, come by. Their boat capsized and they lost their phones and laptops to the dreaded waters. We hug, adrenaline and shock pulsing through our veins, preventing tears from forming. More rain is coming. Maybe it'll wash some of the dirt off the house, we say. No, no more rain, please. <clears throat> I see I have missed a call. I listen to the message. It is the emergency service. Do we still need to be rescued? As I write this, our fuel has run out, our water is about to run out, and the one supermarket left has no food on its shelves. What is our government doing? Yes, what is our government doing? You know, when are people uh, going to cut the crap thinking the government uh, it, it, it is going to come save your ass uh, in an event like this flood or bushfire or earthquake or whatever? Uh, what is the governor? Uh, now, I did read, I think, uh, like two days after this came out, that the Prime Minister of Australia, uh, that little climate-denying planet eater, you know, selling all of that coal uh, to pay for government services, um, you know, mining, particularly mining fossil fuels and selling them to China, is one of the major ways that uh, the Australian government uh, makes money, you know, so they can finance things like building levees and, and rescuing people off of their rooftops. It takes a lot of money to do that, but the Prime Minister, don't even know what that Planet Eater's name is, did admit a couple of days ago that uh, he is finally no longer a climate change denier and understands uh, after looking at the devastation down there uh, that WASF. Yep, so I'm going to wrap it up here and figure out what to do on this bitterly cold, windy day in Florida in the middle of March, one more week in the winter of 2022. As summer bears down, good Lord, you better get out there and enjoy whatever you can enjoy in the spring of 2022 before summer gets here. Bye, guys.